Welcome to JavaScript Jabber. I'm Chris Beekler from Closebrace.com, and with us today is Chris Biscardi, who's going to talk about Gatsby themes. Say hello, Chris. Hey, how's it going? Thanks hey. for having me. <laughs> Happy to have you. Also with us today, we have Amy Knight. Hey, hey, from Nashville. And AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from sunny Provo. This episode is sponsored by GitLab Commit. GitLab's inaugural user event brings together the GitLab community to connect, learn, and inspire. Speakers will showcase the power of DevOps in action through strategy and technology decisions, lessons learned, behind the scenes looks at the development lifecycle, and more. Learn how to innovate the future of software development by registering today. GitLab Commit Brooklyn, September 17th, and GitLab Commit London, October 9th. You can find it at devchat.tv slash GitLab Commit. So Chris, Give us a little bit of information on yourself to start. So I am a uh, independent consultant working with mostly open source startups. One of my clients currently is Gatsby. So I built Gatsby themes for them over the last year or so. So I started about maybe 10 years ago, taught myself how to program, started working in open source basically immediately. And open source has been a large part of my life since then. That's an interesting transition. Can we talk about that for a second? Sure. So when you say you taught yourself to program and then you started an open source, what do you mean by that exactly? First of all, I went to college to play volleyball, right? Nice. <laughs> that was basically the entire reason I went to college because uh, I paid for my schooling. And then I was doing an art major while I was there. And I decided they gave us access to like all the Adobe products and stuff. So it was Flash at the time for me and ActionScript and things like that. And I was like, well, I, it's nice to draw pretty pictures and everything, but like I want to be able to make these things do stuff. Like I, I want to be able to build the thing that somebody uses and not just like draw pictures and tell somebody else to build it. So that was my initial motivation at the time. I started learning ActionScript. I wrote it for a little while, got like my first contracts at like $10, $15 an hour or something like that, not knowing anything at the time basically. And then, yeah, I transitioned into JavaScript when uh, Apple killed Flash. And uh, that's basically my story. I went into open source as a way to, I had to teach myself because we didn't have classes on this thing, right? So the way that I taught myself is basically looking at other people's code and then writing more myself. And I was just like, oh, I guess this open source thing is just how everything is done. So it was just like open source was my default. I never learned anything else. That's really cool. That's interesting because I feel like not a lot of people uh, get started that way. I guess go ahead and tell us a little bit about Gatsby themes then. Well, actually, uh, first, oh, okay. probably for um, for anybody who's listening who's not familiar with Gatsby, maybe we should real quick just go over what Gatsby is. Yeah, like, for example, I don't know what Gatsby is. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so Gatsby is a static site generator is how a lot of people refer to it. I usually refer to it as a progressive web app generator. And the idea is basically like, if you took a server rendered application that had a React app on the other side and squashed it into a node process, that's what you get. So it spits out a bunch of HTML files and it also spits out a client side bundle for you. You end up getting a static site, but you also get the benefits of working with a client side application like React or something like that. So um, how is this similar to or different from uh, Hugo and Jekyll? So with Hugo and Jekyll, you're basically using uh, these template languages, right? You can take markdown files and you can spit them out into HTML, but it's more or less a one-to-one -one correlation. You have a couple of different um, ways to get things like lists of pages and pagination and things like that. But the big difference between the way that Hugo and Jekyll and systems like that model information and the way that Gatsby does is Gatsby uses basically what is a GraphQL API to do all of the data modeling which means that you can use a bunch of remote CMSs to in ingest all of your data, whether it's Contentful or WordPress or something like that, or even just flat files on the system. It all goes through this GraphQL API, which then you can query as if it's a GraphQL API, right? And you can do much richer logic and shareable logic with other people. So is it kind of like declarative versus imperative? In a sense, yes. GraphQL and React tend to um, lean towards more of the declarative nature of things. But all of like the how do I create different pages and logic like that would be definitely imperative. So yeah, I guess take that as you will. And what would you say, is there something else that's similar to this? That Let's say that's more similar to this than Hugo? If you're going to talk about things that are similar to this, you start talking about projects like Next.js. 
it's probably the most similar project to Gatsby in terms of it runs a server for you generally, although I think they have some static support now too. So you get the HTML and then you also get a React app bootstrapped on the other side. I could talk about the differences there, but if you're familiar with something like Next.js, that would be probably closer to Gatsby. Just to be clear, is it Next or Nuxt? Because I see both. I think both of those are effectively the same thing when we're talking about this topic in this okay. way. Okay, all right. So I, but one of them is for Vue and one of them is for React, basically. Oh, okay. All right, well, I am done with my introductory questions as to what the heck this thing is. Excellent. So now we can talk about theming it then. So I'm not particularly familiar with Gatsby. I have worked with Next.js and I've, I was aware of Gatsby's existence before this. I wasn't actually particularly aware that it that it was something that you could theme. I thought you were likely to need to re- sort of custom roll more of your own front end for it than that. So that's an interesting thing to hear. Yeah, so I guess intro to Gatsby themes in these ecosystems like WordPress and things like that, or Hugo and whatnot, you have this concept of themes, right? In WordPress, people are fairly familiar with what that is, so I won't really get into it. But in like Hugo, you basically take a bunch of files, you vendor them into your Go repo, and then you like build your site, right? And these things can give you different data types. They can give you different uh, ways to render that content and things like that. So Gatsby themes are basically a way to take subsections of your Gatsby site, wrap them up as NPM modules, publish them, and then other people can download them and use them. And it can build anything from, you could ship a single component or a set of design tokens, all the way up to shipping an entire blog as this NPM package. And there's a couple APIs to make that nicer on the consuming side as well but that's the general idea. Interesting. So this is way beyond just making sort of visual updates to the site the way, for example, a WordPress theme works. It's it's really about producing reusable components that people can pull into their, their own uh, web apps. Yeah. I mean, I would say that um, if you look at Gatsby themes and you look at WordPress themes, WordPress themes have to operate on a data model. It's just that WordPress provides you that data model by default, right? They, already, they have a built-in data model for how you deal with things, um, and a couple of different plugins to deal with that kind of stuff. But with the Gatsby, you get to define the data model that you want, which means that it's a little bit more flexible, a little bit more generic, which means that somebody has to build that data layer for you if you are not going to build it yourself. Cool. So how did you get started working with this particular platform? So I started working with Gatsby around version 0.7. I think my blog has gone through iterations of Jekyll, iterations of Hugo, iterations of a bunch of different projects. Around 2014, I had chosen React to be uh, Docker's main technology for the front end when I was building a team out there. So this was like, I don't know, 2015, 2016, I was looking for a static site generator for my blog to rewrite things. And uh, I was super into React, so I wanted to use React. And I was looking at a couple of different projects, and Gatsby was uh, the one that was closest to the idea of what I had in my head from what we did at Docker. What we did at Docker was basically use React and render to string to do server-side rendering at the time. And that was way before we have all of like this nice streaming stuff and things like that. So it was basically dynamically generating a static site on the server and then shipping it down. So I took that idea and then was looking for a static site generator that would take the same concepts, right? Basically, a server-side rendered application and a static site are the same thing. It's just when you do the rendering. So I found Gatsby and I started working with it a little bit. And this was pre-GraphQL API. This was pre-1.0. This is a long time ago at this point. And it was basically just uh, react.render to string on a bunch of markdown files. Right. So I got into it. It wasn't quite what I wanted. I wanted this GraphQL data layer. So I made a couple commits to Gatsby and then I went off into a corner uh, and built a proof of concept of a GraphQL backed version of Gatsby. And then came back and they built it into 1.0. And then um, when I was looking for a new consulting work, like maybe a year ago, I sent out a tweet. And Kyle, uh, one of the founders, was sort of like, hey, yeah, you've been around for a while. We have some work. Would you like to do it? What's a good way for people who are interested in this to, to get started? Either, either people who are interested in developing themes for themselves or people who are interested in more of a, a top level of just seeing what's out there. Uh, is there a particularly good place to find that kind of stuff? Yeah, it depends on where you're trying to get started, right? If you're trying to get started just with Gatsby, obviously go to the gatsbyjs.org page. It'll get you started in different places. 
if you're looking to get started with themes specifically and trying to get a feel for how they look and how they feel, there are a couple of official themes. You can go to the gatsbyjs.org slash docs slash themes, and it will give you a starter where you can just do basically Gatsby new and then like a URL to a starter. And it will install a theme for you, give you some content, and you can sort of play around and see what it feels like to use one. Once you get through that, we also have a couple of tutorials about how to build themes that are also on the Gatsby Docs site. So the Gatsby Docs site is usually where you go to start any of these different paths. I kind of have a question, like backing away from like talking about themes and more about Gatsby, if that's okay. Like, like I feel like Jekyll is super easy for beginners to start with. I know like when I first got into programming, I, even before I did my bootcamp, I started taking some classes online and I, I think like literally one of the very first classes was to like, you know, obviously put up your own website and because like, I just didn't want to go like the WordPress route or something like that. And so I did Jekyll because I felt like it was going to be easier for me to kind of like make some customizations for the class for some of the projects that they had us do. So like how beginner friendly is using Gatsby in general? So in general, if you're using Gatsby, I know I've mentioned a bunch of different technologies at this point, right? I've mentioned GraphQL, I've mentioned React. There's a bunch that I didn't mention, like if you're using CSS and JS or something like that, or like integrating SAS and things. So if you're looking to get started with just Gatsby, and you don't really know any of those technologies or anything like that, it may take you a little bit. And that's part of the reason that we build themes, right? Because with themes, you can install a single package. It'll give you an entire blog. And then when you want to go make changes, we have this concept called shadowing. And you can create a single file to replace a single React component. So instead of having to build everything, instead of having to build your data structures and your React component tree and et cetera, all you need to do is like, I don't like the way this blog post renders. I'm going to like fudge a React component and basically write HTML and I'm going to render it differently. Okay. I have multiple questions. So I want to make sure I understand too. So maybe like we'll say like WordPress might be like the easiest thing to get started and then, or Jekyll. I feel like Jekyll is going to be like a little bit more down to the middle and then maybe Gatsby is like a little bit more advanced than that. Does that seem correct? I'm just going to plug and say Hugo is probably easier than Jekyll okay. because it's not Ruby. It's wicked fast and it's a lot simpler. That's true. So the other question I have, because I feel like, you know, like Gatsby is like pretty hot right now. It's a lot of people are talking about it. It's like big buzzword, but also I'm of the opinion, and I I wish, like, Chris Fernandez was here, but AJ, you can, like, also represent him a little bit, too. Like, if I'm just... What? What? He now became the lead contrarian? (laughs) How did that happen? (laughs) Well, like, here's the thing. So, if I'm building, like, a pretty bare-bones website, like, blog or something, like, I'm probably not going to reach for React. So... When you said about, was it shadowing and how I could like plug and play React components, like help me understand why I would want to introduce like more complexity and use some kind of like blogging platform with that has React as a dependency. Sure. So I think there are two ways to approach the answer to this question, basically. One of them is talking about sort of... um, some developer's personal blog. Like we're all pretty technical here. We can all go and run Hugo and get a site up and running fairly easily, right? And then there's the people who uh, are not as comfortable getting down into a bunch of Go code or a bunch of Ruby code or something like that. So at the other end, you're saying that WordPress is an easy install because it's basically everywhere. It's got a GUI one-click install for somebody somewhere, right? Whatever platform you're on, yeah, which is what I don't like, it. but yeah. <laughs> right. But it's it's sort of like WordPress is at this super user-friendly, like your marketing person can go and click a couple buttons and get a WordPress site. Now, if they want to change how it looks and things like that, it gets a lot more complicated. But getting set up, WordPress has a like this five-minute install. Hugo does not have that five-minute install. Jekyll does not have that five-minute install, unless you're using it on a platform like GitHub, 
in which case you can click a couple buttons like you can with WordPress. Yeah, true. And like I could, I remember back in the day, man, like whatever I was using for hosting, like I literally just like clicked a bunch of buttons and didn't even have to do anything on my actual laptop. Well, so, I'm not like, <laughs> like I didn't have to actually touch the code like locally. And to be clear, when you're using Jekyll and Hugo, the only reason you have to be concerned with Ruby with Jekyll is because you have to somehow get the freaking thing installed and all the gems configured. And (laughs) there's, there's nothing else that it's just Markdown and basically mustache style templates. And same thing with Hugo, except Hugo's go. So there's no configuration or like dependencies or anything you have to manage because it's just a single binary. You just download it. Right. So if we talk about uh, Gatsby and the ease of install process, right? Themes has taken us from you have to build your own application to you can just write a bunch of markdown files. So it's the same level as Jekyll now, basically, right? If you want to write a blog, you Gatsby start or whatever, you have to install Gatsby, like you have to install Jekyll, and then you can Gatsby new, Gatsby starter blog, and then you have a blog that's run off the theme and you can just get going. Gatsby does not currently have one of the sort of GUI installers that we see in uh, sort of GitHub and um, other platforms for WordPress, right? There's no place to go to click a couple times and get a Gatsby site. So it's on the way to getting easier to install, but currently is still not as easy to install as some other platforms. Well, it's in Node, so I mean, it can't be that bad other than you need gigabit internet to get the NPM modules. <laughs> <laughs> like. It, yeah. Node, Node usually doesn't fail. And I'm imagining Gatsby doesn't probably require any native modules that would fail. No, not unless you're using some plugin. Like I know SAS uses like libc or whatever. So yeah. if you're using SAS in your Gatsby site, then you have this C add-on that you might be using. But other than that, Gatsby itself doesn't have any C building to do. So it's just a JavaScript package. I think that's one of the great virtues of Node is that... In a world where, you know, we had Python and Ruby that, yeah, if they come pre-installed on your system and the version that's pre-installed on your system is the right version, you're golden. But the minute that it's like not that and versions are so particular, it's a nightmare. But no, very, very easy. Very rarely do you ever have version conflicts. And when you do, it's usually on optional compiled modules where there's like a C plugin to make it fast, but the JavaScript plain vanilla JavaScript thing is just as fast most of the time. So I think, yeah. I think it's a great virtue of, of anything that's written in Node is, is going to be pretty cross-platform compatible. It's going to work on Windows, Mac, and Linux really well. You basically get almost all the benefits of Go with Node. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And then because you're implementing this in Node, you get all the nice things like hot reloading, et cetera, right? So if you modify files in your Gatsby project, it just goes through and shows up in your browser and you don't really have to say, do anything. Well, that, that I think is pretty standard across the board. I think all the Ruby, Ruby toolkits and you know, most of the other things, I, I don't think that that's particularly unique, the hot reloading, but I, I do agree that it's certainly a benefit. Okay, so backing up, just to make sure, I want to make sure like we answered the question I had. So why would I reach for, I guess, like, I don't oh, know. Right. To me, I'm just a little <laughs> bit cautious of, like if I'm trying to implement something pretty simple, like a, a blog or something like that, like I'm probably going to try to hold off on using a framework as long as possible. But help me understand why I would want the ability to like do the shadowing with React like you mentioned. Right. So like I said, there's basically two ways to approach the answer to the question. The first one we just went over, which is basically like you've got your Hugo for your basic site. It's a blog, you're a developer, you just want to write some markdown files and get it over with and be done. Totally cool. Go with Hugo, go with Jekyll, go with whatever you want. On the other end, we've got basically, if you think about the larger static sites that you would, or larger products that you would think of that would make sense as static sites, right? You think of newspapers or something like that. You think of something like the New York Times. They're like They're literally just showing articles. Yeah. At right? a basic concept, showing articles. And then you start thinking about all the things that go into their platform, right? You start thinking about they have a bunch of ads, they have user login, they have customized dashboards for people who like specific topics and are logged in, right? They end up having all of this extra functionality, like maybe comments and things like that, that is built on top of the static site. So you can build things like the New York Times site or like an e-commerce store using Gatsby. 
And then you can build all your marketing pages out the same way that you would build out any static page, right? With like a markdown or an MDX file or something like that. And then you also have the ability to expand into as much dynamic nature as you need when you need it. Okay, that helps paint the picture more. So maybe I go this route if I have like this end goal vision that I'm going to iterate to a point where it's going to grow in complexity. Yeah, if if you're going to keep your project simple forever, choose whatever you want, go with whatever you want, whatever makes you happy. If you're going to have a project that grows over time, that project is going to get more complex over time. And Gatsby can help you handle that complexity as it grows, as you actually need to add more JavaScript interactivity on the other side. Awesome. So I, I would say, like, I don't, I don't see that being a problem with static site generators because typically you have a layout file, like this is the layout for articles, for example. And in that, you just include a script tag as part of the layout so that you get your comments widget or your Facebook login widget or, you know, whatever it is, you just add your script tag right there and you still get it. I think the argument that you had earlier about this being more a for progressive web apps, so you're not... You're trying to build something that's more integrated, it sounds like. Something that is less modular in the sense of discrete components that have nothing to do with each other, but you're building more towards like an app where you have many components that are interrelated in hopefully, you know, loosely-ish coupled ways, but ultimately tightly coupled ways because they build a product together. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. Okay, because I, being, being a minimalist, I, I don't want people to hear FUD about static site generators can't do this or can't do that and think they have to use something like, you know, Gatsby. That said, of React course. is really popular right now. And I, I mean, anything that can be built in React will. Therefore, uh, if that is your... <laughs> <laughs> can we update uh, the quote from... Oh, I'm blanking on his name and make a new quote. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. You can... If React is your hammer, then a static site can be a nail. Yes. And to be clear, Gatsby is a React-based project. You're not going to take Gatsby and you're not going to build a view. You're not going to go use mustache templates or something like that. So if you're considering using Gatsby, the assumption is that you're already using React somewhere. Yeah. And you could use React with Hugo, but you're probably learning fewer paradigms if you use Gatsby, I would guess. Yeah, I could probably write a lot on the topic of why you shouldn't use two different languages to do your server-side rendering and client-side rendering, which is what that effectively is. But it's definitely possible, as you said before, right? You include a couple script tags and then you get an app on the other side, for sure. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Can I ask one more question that is kind of like related to what we're talking about? (laughs) No! (laughs) Related? What do you mean? (laughs) Well, then, like, all this leads me to the question of, say, I'm using, say, I didn't expect something to grow, or I have something that's older. Have you heard about people's experiences, like, migrating over to Gatsby from other, like, if they have WordPress or something like that? Like, is that horrible? So at this point, there's a bunch of projects in the WordPress ecosystem that expose all of the WordPress data basically as a headless CMS through a GraphQL API. So if you're going to work with WordPress, what basically happens is you interface with WordPress through this GraphQL API, you get your content, and then you build your pages as you would normally build them in Gatsby. So you end up getting this nice separation of uh, this nice editing interface in WordPress for anybody that wants to do that. And then you don't have to deal with actually running a WordPress server because you compile everything statically and then ship it. Right. Which probably helps allay some security concerns, among other things, because I know the WordPress team is constantly fighting 
a tremendous amount of hackers that target that platform. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've had this conversation, and I think every company that I've ever been even club, like semi related to, where the marketing team wants WordPress and the engineering team doesn't want anything to do with WordPress. Yep. Uh, so you end up with WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a question that I think is also related to all of this. We had an entire episode not too long ago about the benefits and challenges of server side rendering with Dan Shapir, but I was wondering if you wanted to take a few minutes to just talk about, you know, what you perceive as the reason why server-side rendering is such a great thing. And also you mentioned it's better to do it with a single language rather than trying to split it between languages. And I'm curious if you want to expand on that a little. Sure. I think that my opinion will probably be um, a little bit off from what people may think it is. Like, I don't necessarily think that server-side rendering is a good thing, right? I don't like running a server. I don't like the additional complexity that comes from that. What I do like is the ability to pre-render a bunch of pages that I can pre-render and then not have to run a server to render those pages when I need to. So like I said before, um, I've built a React universal application or isomorphic or whatever we were calling it back then in like 2014 and 2015 at Docker, right? This was a great decision at the time. We needed the SEO benefits uh, for the Docker Hub and whatever other projects we had at the time. And that's basically the only reason that I would suggest people use server-side rendering at this point. If you need SEO, then yeah, go server-side rendering. If you don't, then probably take a really hard look at whether you really need server-side rendering or not. So I I would say that the benefits of server-side rendering really come in when you have a build process that pre-renders stuff like Gatsby does, and not necessarily when you're running a server like something like Nextwood. Because then you get your HTML, it ships really quickly because you don't have to generate it. You can just put it on S3 or Netlify or whatever your platform of choice is. It comes down really fast. You get a great user experience. On the other side, you bootstrap your client side app. And the HTML that was generated was generated with basically the same logic that you use to generate the client side, which means that you don't have to write things in two different languages in two different places every time you want to influence something. And that's really the the biggest problem that I've seen with server-side rendering, especially with two different languages, where somebody will write their backend in Go, render a bunch of server-side templates out, and then write their front-end in React, and write a bunch of client-side uh, logic to render out their application. And then you need to build something, and you go, oh, we need this feature, but we need it in both places now. So now we need to write the Go logic and the React logic, and we're writing it twice, and it's slightly different because they're two different languages, et cetera. So that's my big problem with sort of server-side rendering. And yeah, that's that's where I would go on that. Gotcha. So i say that type of server-side rendering is different. Well, I mean, you, you kind of made the distinction. There's static site generation pre-rendering versus server-side rendering. Right. And to me, I think the complexity of liquid, excuse me, liquid templates or Go templates or mustache templates that are typically used for static site or pre-rendered sites, I typically don't find them to be obnoxious or heavy. I, I think the, the greatest temptation is in liquid templates. People want to like rebuild Ruby the entire language into template systems sometimes, and that can be a little hairy. But for the most part, these mustache style template systems I don't think you typically have that problem because like I said before, you're just including a script tag and you know, you're know you building out the generic part and anything that's app-like, you don't rewrite that code again in your mustache style template. You just have like a placeholder or whatever and then when the app loads, it does the thing that it needs to do and you really just keep the logic there in the JavaScript, I would yeah. think. I, I mean, I, I would agree with you except for the fact that I've, rarely seen any real world application that's built this way with a different language on the back end and a different language on the front end. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that a language on the back end though. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't. Yeah. What what I meant is sort of like a Golang or something on the back end, right? Because at some point you have to still deal with all of your data fetching, right? So now your data fetching has to happen in like Golang to feed it into these simple mustache templates or whatever you're using. And then your data fetching has to happen on the client side too. And you're probably fetching the same data, right? To render basically the same things. Because what happens if somebody lands on page A, so now your Golang has to go fetch a bunch of data, feed it into the mustache templates, render a bunch of HTML. Your React app has to bootstrap. And then... 
I would think not. I would think not. I would, I mean, like, I'm sure people do it that way, but the most common thing that comes to mind, and I, you probably have a better example that, that illustrates your point better, but the most common thing that comes to my mind is comments. You know, we take our, our typical static site, our marketing site, our blog, whatever it is, it's all pretty much the same. It, you know, it, it's, it's a content driven site. It's about getting people access to information and the way that they interact with it will be through comments. And with the comment, you just have like a little placeholder, like comments loading, and then the script loads, it grabs your comments, it goes and fetches it from wherever, it might be a backend you wrote, might just be discus or whatever. And then the comments load, and by the person, by the time the person gets down to that part of the page, that was done hundreds of thousands of milliseconds ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree with you in principle. In practice, I have not seen it work out that way, is the way that I'll put it. So uh, okay. if you are loading discuss, for example, or like comments or something like that, I've always seen them load after you scroll to them. So you scroll to them, then you see your loading indicator, and then you see the comments pop in later, as opposed to them loading when the page loads. Well, yeah, and that that's right. the discus or discuss or however you pronounce it, specific way of doing it. Maybe they have an option to not lazy load. I agree. That, that actually is annoying. But I would think not all comments behave that way and not all modules need to be written that way. But I do, I, specifically with that example that I gave, no, that was an excellent counterpoint because I, I don't like that. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. I think we're on the same page here. Darn it. <laughs> AJ likes to fight with the guests. That's uh... Yeah, I'm the resident contrarian, Chris. <laughs> don't ruin my deal. <laughs> you, can't, you can't yell at Chris Ferdinand. He's not even here today. That, all right, I had another quick question not so much about the server-side rendering uh, aspect of things, but you mentioned that, or at least it's, it seems like Gatsby is really strongly geared towards larger content-oriented sites. Like you mentioned newspapers is a good example. I was thinking something like ESPN.com is another one. I'm wondering, though, can you build more app-oriented websites with Gatsby, uh, and would you recommend that as an approach? Yeah, so if... Like you said, it's really good for these ESPN, these New York Times, these e-commerce sites and things like that. And when you build sort of an app on top of Gatsby, if you're familiar with something like Create React App, right? Create React App is basically a way for everybody to gather a bunch of Webpack config, gather a bunch of Babel config, gather a bunch of other things, ship them in a single NPM package such that you can sort of install it and upgrade it later and not have to worry about all that configuration and things like that, right? And that's how you build your app. And then you're, at that point, you're basically just writing React. So personally, if I build a web app today, I use Gatsby instead of Create React App. So it's definitely possible to build a web app without any static generation if you want to using Gatsby, right? And you would do this for pages behind a login site anyway, right? So if you're building your static site and you still have user login and you have like a dashboard behind a login, that is a core use case for Gatsby. So it's definitely possible to do that. So you can basically use it as a, an alternative to create React app or other options for just rapidly spinning up your environment so you don't have to spend a ton of time on that and you can get started just writing components. Yeah, and one thing I'll add to that actually, um, since it popped into my head, is we have basically people at different companies using Gatsby themes to build their own internal create React app. So Create React App doesn't actually let you really modify anything. So there's separate projects like React App Rewired and whatever that are sort of unofficial that let you patch in things. But Gatsby Themes let you bundle everything that you need together. So for example, uh, the IBM Carbon team is using Gatsby Themes to ship basically their Carbon design system to all of the people that want to use it. The Apollo team is using it to generate a bunch of different microsites for different documentation aspects. You can basically build your own Create React app, ship it to your users internally, and they get this nice upgrade path. Nice. So another quick question. Do you have any examples of, I, you've, you've used a blog a couple of times of something you could plug into a site that would be a good use of a Gatsby theme. Do you have anything else uh, that you've worked on specifically or that you've seen that you thought was particularly cool that would make a good example of the type of thing you could use themes to provide? Yeah, so there's a bunch of people um, building themes that pack in the logic for a specific CMS platform. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a blog, right? It can be your marketing site or whatever. 
but basically people are building themes that are matched with, say, like WordPress or matched with that OCMS or Contentful or whatever. And it contains all of the logic such that you can operate almost exclusively in the CMS. The theme deals with processing and rendering all of the pages, and then you end up being able to do whatever you want on the client side, the React components and rendering and things like that. Another thing that I've seen is people actually building uh, Stripe or Shopify into themes such that you can have a Shopify site, set up all of your products, and then it just gives you basically a store. It seems like a very, very robust and powerful system. Yeah, it is basically anything you can do in a Gatsby site. So any, and Gatsby is basically plugin based. So any plugin that you want to use or any source or et cetera, et cetera, you can package up into a theme and then reuse. So it's basically, if you can write it in JavaScript, you can ship it as a Gatsby theme, which makes it very powerful with all the additional things that Gatsby gives you. And also one of the reasons that we built themes because you need to sort of package that stuff up somehow because not everybody's going to write everything. A few years ago at a JavaScript conference, I was approached by Nader Dabit. And you might know him for the React Native Radio podcast. He's also a developer evangelist for Amazon. And when he came to me, we had a conversation about React Native. And the thing that I love about React Native is that it's approachable, it's web technology, and it's cross-platform. And it makes a lot of things really easy for developers to jump in and do interesting things on mobile with JavaScript. So we've had this show now running for several years, React Native Radio, where we interview people about the React Native ecosystem, some of the things that are coming out in React and how they affect mobile, and other options that you have for mobile development. So if you're doing mobile development, you're doing it in JavaScript, you're looking for a good option, or maybe you're just trying to stay current with React Native, then go check out React Native Radio at reactnativeradio.com. Let's do some picks. Chris, if you want, we can start with you. Um, I am unprepared for picks. I did not know that I needed to pick things. Uh, no problem. So, uh, <laughs> typically at the, end of the, uh, at the end of each episode, we each do some picks. They do not have to be tech-related. I've uh, picked all kinds of stuff. Music and books come up pretty often. Why don't we start? Amy, do you have something? I can find something. I also should have been prepared. Um, I was I'm, prepared. Looking... I'm prepared. Pick me. Pick me. Okay, all right. Go AJ. Go AJ. Right. Go. Okay. So for those of you that are viewing online right now, that being none of you, I'm holding up this amazing book with a piece of toilet paper stuck in it. You can guess how it took me so long to finish. It's Sam Walton, Made in America, My Story. It was a year ago or two years ago when I first picked it up. Then I kind of I kind of left it as a bio break reading, and so it's it's taken me a long time to get through it. But it's Sam Walton talking about how he built Walmart, and it gave me such great respect for Steve Jobs of his day. Like maybe a little bit nicer. It seems like people had good things to say about him. And I mean, you can kind of see how you know, just like Steve Jobs died, and now Apple's just going 180 degrees the other direction. You know, Sam Walton died, and Walmart just isn't. It is not the company that's talked about in the book quite the same. There's a lot of the values have carried on, but it's you, know, you could tell that it's different. And I don't know, he just has a lot of wisdom and he seemed like a really down-to-earth guy. And uh, he's definitely got some opinions that are, are uh, counter culture for today's culture. Like he's very much into the belief that, you know, giving people a job is, is part of what, what helps them, not giving handouts and that sort of thing. He backs it up with sound reasoning. It's, you know, it, it doesn't sound like just some moral, like, blah, 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 this is how things should be. But he kind of backs it up with, with you know, his, his view of experience. And I, and I kind of agree with it. And then also another thing I'm going to pick is, so for those of you that are Owl City fans, if you have not listened to uh, Cinematic or didn't know that Cinematic was out, you should definitely listen to that because it's kind of the accumulation of the year before he did um, basically a, a theatrical score every month and released it. So there were 11 of them, not 12 for some reason. And then he went on and incorporated all of what he you know, learned from that experimentation and, and brought it into cinematic, which is just an amazing album. I think it's his best because it combines all of his like true self because he, he went through that period where he was very poppy because, you know, obviously the record labels wanted to be poppy. It just wasn't him and you could tell. And, and this one just seems to be more like, him but i actually what i actually meant to do was go completely in the other direction so even before owl city there was sky sailing but before sky sailing he was doing swimming with dolphins 
And Swimming with Dolphins, so the first album, he's part of it. The second album, he's not. But Swimming Do- with Dolphins is, is pretty darn awesome. And so if you're, if you're into that whole thing and you didn't know about Sky Sailing or Swimming with Dolphins, check those out too because they're, they're awesome. And they're, Sky Sailing is kind of like the acoustic pre-electronic version of, of Adam Young. And then, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm rambling now. I'll end. I can go again. <laughs> All right, let's go for it. Like, I found a bunch of stuff I liked yesterday, and apparently I didn't save it, so that was bad on my part. I'm going to go with this blog post, some things that might help you make better software. I think this is not a might. I think it is. A, it, is it will make it, you make better software. But basically, it just kind of talks about, which, I don't know, I'm just really burned out on the whole startup thing. Uh, I think where I'm at now is not super startup-y, so that's good, but... It's kind of like, you know, you you can't always have quality if you're at a startup, unfortunately, because sometimes you just have to like prove product market fit and get stuff out the door. But uh, the article is just all about like different things on quality and about like an attitude towards quality and things like that. So that will be my pick for today. Cool. I could go now too. Cool. cool. Sure. Go for it, Chris. (laughs) So I've been doing a lot of Twitch streaming lately. And for me, it's usually just whatever I happen to be working on at the time. But my friend does a show on Twitch. His name is Jason Langstorff. And he does work for Gatsby. So his content is very much Gatsby related. So I guess topical for this podcast. But he does a uh, series of shows throughout the week. And they are well produced. And they are on different topics. And I wish that more people streamed. So I will point people to that Twitch show in the hopes of uh, inspiring some more people to stream. Awesome. I've been uh, curious about uses of Twitch that aren't strictly streaming video games, which is obvious where, obviously where the platform started and still probably its major usage. So that's cool. I'll, I'll definitely, uh, definitely check that out. And all right, I guess that means it's my turn to do picks. Uh, I'm going hyper local on this one, which means it may not appeal to everybody listening. But uh, if you were in the New England area, and particularly if you're in the Providence, Rhode Island area, which is where I am, Venture Cafe has opened. They technically are opening a day from now, but by the time this podcast actually goes live, they will have opened in downtown Providence. I've had a chance to check out their space. It's amazing. They are a foundation, a nonprofit foundation, I believe, that works with startups to help them achieve their goals. Uh, They have a tremendous amount of resources uh, from connecting startups with appropriate mentors uh, to they host various events, uh, pitch sessions, all kinds of stuff. So if you are in Boston, you may already know about Venture Cafe because they've had a presence there for quite some time. They've helped a ton of startups there. They have now opened an additional office down here in Rhode Island, which I think is awesome. I'm very involved in promoting the local startup scene in this city. I think it's a great place to live. So if you're at all interested in any of that, then definitely check out VentureCafeProvidence.org. And uh, if you're not in the Northeast or not interested in Rhode Island, then next week I'll pick something else. So that's all I got. Cool. Yeah, I think that'll uh, wrap it up. Thanks very much to Chris Biscardi for uh, coming on board and telling us all about Gatsby and Gatsby themes and giving me a whole lot of information to digest for sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Hi. Bye, everybody. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.